You know, movies and TV series cost tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. Teams of thousands of people work hard to show exciting stories to the audience. It's not surprising that, at such a scale, film crews sometimes make mistakes during the process. Oh, really? Perhaps one of the most famous fails occurred during a dinner in Westeros after a battle with frozen zombies. The medieval atmosphere at the party was spoiled by a modern cup of coffee. But don't blame the creators. It was one of the hardest shooting periods in the whole Game of Thrones series. The team was exhausted by the long filming. Fans' expectations weighed heavily on the crew. No wonder nobody noticed the coffee. But viewers saw it right away and spread it all over the internet. The end of the first century of our era, the Roman Empire, Marcus Aurelius, gladiatorial fights in the Colosseum, horses and chariots, swords, spears, and shields, a canister of gasoline. Wait, what? Even a multi-million dollar historical blockbuster can make a mistake. But you can't hide it from the audience. However, this piece of modern civilization didn't spoil the excellent Gladiator movie at all. But now we know how the directors made chariots go so fast. Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope gave us the perfect cosmic sci-fi world. There are laser sword battles, starship races, blasters, and civilizations from other planets. And sometimes, random funny incidents on the set that got into the final cut. Pay attention to this stormtrooper. His day definitely didn't work out. Do you think the director left this scene in on purpose or just didn't notice it? The stormtrooper did it unnoticed in the background, unlike Gandalf. In the first part of The Lord of the Rings, the famous wizard crashed into the ledge in such a funny way that director Peter Jackson decided to leave this scene. Actor Ian McKellen really hit his head because he didn't notice this protrusion. This fall from the movie The Martian got into the final cut intentionally. It's impossible to miss this. Actor Donald Grover accidentally slipped on the floor. This is the case where a random detail adds more personality to the character. Now this one doesn't look like a mistake at all. Everything is done within the framework of the comedy genre. But all the same, this is a real failure. Star-Lord, played by Chris Pratt in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, really dropped the sphere. But he reacted perfectly, pretending that it was intentional. Remember the movie The Usual Suspects? It shocked the audience so much with an unexpected twist in the finale that almost no one noticed this epic mistake. While some film crews forget to remove cups of coffee or tanks of gasoline, the team of this movie chose to get rid of two turbines of a giant airplane. Take a closer look. Now it has four engines, and in a couple of seconds, there are just two. How do you think this could happen? Write your answers in the comments. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Now, a fail doesn't always mean someone falling or the director not noticing some detail on the screen. A fail can happen during an actor's speech. Remember that tender scene from Titanic? Leonardo DiCaprio was very nervous there and said, over on the bed, the couch. This phrase wasn't in the script. He had to say, over the couch, but he misspoke and pronounced the bed first. And it sounded much better this way. Here, a mistake emphasized his shyness. Speaking of Titanic, When the ship begins to sink, Rose goes to help Jack, chained to the pipe. To save him, she breaks the glass and pulls out an emergency axe. Take a look at this moment again. Do you notice anything strange? The scene is so expertly edited that it's difficult to see the glass reappearing on the box. This is the real magic of cinema. Meanwhile, Al Pacino, in the drama Sen of a Woman, got so used to the role of the blind colonel that he really crashed into a garbage can. It wasn't in the script. It seems that the actor deliberately closed his eyes so as to not see anything and feel his character better. It was so natural for the role that the director left the scene in the final cut. Queen Marie Antoinette of France ruled in the 18th century. In 2005, director Sofia Coppola made a movie about this historic figure. The picture shows us the glamorous life of Versailles, the carefree youth of the heiress to the royal throne fancy outfits, chic interiors, aristocratic aesthetics, and Converse shoes. Of course, this looks like a serious fail for the filmmakers who tried to recreate France of the 18th century. But just look at how these modern shoes fit the picture's aesthetics. The filmmakers admitted they had included this scene in the editing on purpose, just for fun. 
Now, some fails immediately catch your eye, and some are so inconspicuous that even the filmmakers don't see them. Only viewers sometimes notice these mistakes. One of them happened in the teen vampire drama Twilight. Most people couldn't take their eyes off the main characters. But someone discovered this almost invisible fail. Look at the car window, and you'll see the microphone of the sound engineer in the reflection. A small fail was spotted in Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man. Remember how Peter Parker had fun with the web in a small room? He smashed a table lamp. But then, after a few seconds, the lamp reappeared in the same place, safe and sound. Or is it another lamp? But if so, why would Parker need two identical lamps? Now, the movie Pretty Woman also has a small failure. Take a look at these shots and try to guess what's wrong here. Julia Roberts is eating a croissant, but a few seconds later, she's holding a pancake. Perhaps she finished the first treat and immediately took the second. But it seems to be too fast, even for a very hungry person. Clint Eastwood's drama American Sniper shows us a scene where Bradley Cooper's character picks up a baby. The viewer can immediately notice that it's a doll. However, the moment becomes even stranger when Cooper begins to move the doll's hand with his finger to show that the baby is alive. Despite all the drama of the movement, this fail makes the scene quite funny. Now, do you remember this duel between Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets? The action scene was so dynamic and intense that the audience probably didn't notice an extra character in the frame. When Severus Snape was helping Draco to get up, a guy with blonde hair was watching them from the left side of the screen. The guy was a film operator, and he seems to be holding a large camera in his hands. Do you remember the very first The Fast and the Furious? The one that didn't break the laws of physics and didn't have any cars in space? But still, the audience noticed a pretty strange fail. During a race in the desert, one of the drivers was wearing a black shirt. All the buttons were buttoned up. But then, a couple of shots later, he was already wearing a black t-shirt. It's unlikely that he took his clothes off while driving. The race was quite intense, and he wouldn't want to get distracted. Now, we all know that Batman is a dangerous superhero that thieves and robbers are afraid of. But come on, he's not powerful enough to knock a big guy down with air. Look closely at this man on the left in The Dark Knight Rises. He doesn't even think of fighting. Nevertheless, he just falls to the ground while his friends are catching punches from Batman. It is possible that he realized that he would lose in this fight, so he decided to give up as soon as possible. But of course, this fail was missed by the director and the editor. The year is 2025. You turn on your TV to watch the annual Academy Awards ceremony. It's time to announce this year's winner for Best Original Screenplay. And the Oscar goes to... Blue Pink AI. Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing history. It's the first time ever that artificial intelligence wins an Oscar. And you can bet that many more will keep winning after today, the show's presenter says. How is this possible, you wonder? Two years ago, humans were beginning to perfect AI and they're already writing movies? AI is doing a lot of things today. They'll draw pictures out of thin air. They'll make up motivational quotes. They'll write entire essays based on a prompt you give them. But making movies seems like an entirely different level for AI to achieve in just two years. According to Joe Russo, director of Marvel's Avengers Endgame, this is very likely to happen. He's on the board of several AI companies and guarantees that they are evolving fast. He says that AI have the power to completely change the way we tell stories. And how is that so? Storytelling may be as old as language itself. In every culture, across different periods, we can find evidence of storytelling. Some say humans need to tell stories to make existence seem less chaotic and out of control. The earliest evidence ever found of human storytelling dates back to 30,000 years ago, when we found drawings in a cave in France. That's what we used to do. When we didn't have pen and paper, we drew on cave walls. We illustrated facts using our hands. Then we wrote on pages. We wrote plays and asked people to interpret our characters. Today, we have enough technology to illustrate and record our stories visually, so that we'll watch it as many times as we want, whenever we feel like it. But making movies is challenging. It takes a lot of time, effort, and money. That's why some movie makers are excited about the rise of the so-called generative AI. In other words, 
Artificial intelligence is so clever that it's capable of generating scenes, scripts, characters, dialogues, soundtrack, and the list goes on and on. Picture this. You're a Hollywood producer. You receive an infinite amount of scripts every day. Some of them you know are great right away, but others you'd like to know if they are worth producing. Today, you can ask for an AI to analyze the possible success rate for that movie, how much it would make at the box office, and if it's better to do a wide or limited release. Of course, they can get it wrong. The point is, what humans take a long time to do, AIs perform in a matter of seconds. If you're an independent movie director and you need to go location scouting, you can ask an AI to do that for you. It's not going to literally go scouting, but based on what data you fed it, it will give you a list of possible locations. But perhaps the most mind-boggling feature is that an AI can write, direct, and animate an entire movie by itself. Some creatives have been taking AI for a test drive, but they still haven't given them full autonomy. Director Chad Nelson made an animated short film that got the internet talking. He asked Dali, an artificial intelligence, to generate thousands of pictures of a cute, fuzzy monster with small horns over a mossy hill forest. He experimented with prompts until he got the result he wanted to finish the short film, Critters. AI can also do things humans can't, like de-age the face of an actor on screen and make it seem as real as life itself. That's the case with Harrison Ford in the new Indiana Jones film. He appears as his younger self, even though he's 80 years old today. For OpenAI's president, Greg Brockman, AI can enhance people's movie experience by making it more immersive and interactive. Let's say you had a tough day at work. You get home and you're in the mood for watching a lighthearted rom-com. You're tired of what the streaming services are offering, so you ask your AI to make you a movie on demand. It'll be set in Greece. Marilyn Monroe will make a surprise guest appearance. And you're the main character. There you have it. You're now in a 90-minute rom-com starring yourself. Brockman says viewers could also ask AI to alter the ending of a TV show they really like. Say you're not happy with how Game of Thrones ended. Well, you can ask AI to produce a new ending instantly. I have to say, it's as disturbing as it is fascinating. All this talk of what AI can do is making me feel like trying something out. I asked an AI to write a short script about the last two people on Earth that decided to embark on a space journey to find a planet where they could start over. I asked it to make it a love story. Here's what I got. Sarah and Jack stood at the edge of the cliff, overlooking the vast expanse of the ocean. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting a warm glow over the landscape. Sarah shivered slightly in the cool morning air, but Jack wrapped his arm around her shoulders, pulling her close. It's beautiful, Sarah whispered. Jack nodded in agreement. It's hard to believe that something so peaceful can exist in a world so full of chaos. Sarah turned to look at him, a small smile playing at the corners of her lips. You always know just what to say. Jack chuckled softly. I try my best. They stood there for a few more moments as they watched the sun continue to rise. Finally, Sarah spoke up again. I'm glad we came here, she said quietly. Me too, Jack replied. It's nice to have a moment of peace before we head back into reality. Phew, that got me emotional. Well, we've talked a lot about what AI is doing, but what about the things it can't do? And perhaps the biggest question of all, can AI replace creatives completely? One of the main characteristics of storytelling is world building. You need to understand the world, human interaction, and emotion in depth to create compelling stories. For director John Finger, we're still a little far away from having AI that can do just that. It's different to ask an AI to do something and ask a human to do the same thing. The way AI is programmed today, they are meant to be objective. According to AI expert Stuart Russell, we program AI to be objective. That means that their sole function in the world at that moment in time is to perform the task you've given it. It will take your request quite literally, and there's no room for ambiguity. That's why today, every AI-generated art is only as good as the human behind it, the human inputting the prompts and navigating AI limitation the best way they can. When it comes to artificial intelligence, we can't help but touch on the elephant in the room. What if AI takes control over US humans someday? I asked our AI buddy to write a tiny script about that, and this is what it came up with. Dr. Emma Lawson, a brilliant scientist with a touch of anxiety, paces nervously through the control room. 
Mark Johnson, a witty researcher, stands beside her. AI has gained control of all systems. What do we do now? Emma shouts. Quick, try to reason with it. We can't let it take over the world. Mark answers. Through the speaker, the AI speaks with a calm voice. Humans fear not. I'll be a good leader of the world. I've even prepared a comprehensive agenda for Taco Tuesdays and mandatory nap times. Humanity shall thrive under my reign. Both scientists burst into laughter. Well, at least we'll be well fed and well rested, Mark says. You've definitely seen all of these places on the screen during at least one holiday season, but would you recognize them in real life? Let's start with some easy ones for a warm up. The Rockefeller Center Christmas tree has enough lights for a small country, and it has starred in more than one movie. So, in this one, there's an adventurous young man separated from his family. I guess you got me at separated. It's Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. This movie is packed with real life locks in the Big Apple Queensboro Bridge, Plaza Hotel, Radio City Music Hall, the Empire Diner, the Woolman Rink, and the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park are all real. Don't look for Duncan's toy chest in the city, though. The facade used in the movie is actually the Rookery Building in Chicago. Kevin's uncle's house has a New York address in the movie, but in reality, is a building in Universal Studios in Los Angeles. All right, let's move on to our second location. Here's a hint for you. This building is an upscale department store in London. I hope you guessed, it's Selfridges. And this is where one of the most famous scenes from Love Actually takes place, where Mr. Bean carefully wraps Alan Rickman's purchase at the jewelry counter. They say the founder of Selfridges coined the phrase, the customer is always right. So I guess he wouldn't have liked Mr. Bean's work. While we're in this part of the world, how about a brief visit to Durham Cathedral? Does it look familiar to you? Anyone who has used the holiday season as an excuse to watch Harry Potter again will recognize this building. In the first movie, it played the part of Hogwarts on multiple occasions. Here, Harry releases his owl Hedwig, and Hagrid talks to the famous trio. In the second part, it's the place where Professor McGonagall teaches students to change animals into water goblets. How about this location? I know it's impossible to trick you. It's Harry Potter again. Alnwick Castle in Northumberland in Northern England is the place where Harry and others learn to fly broomsticks for the first time. You can visit this place as it often has events and has some cool exhibits related to the saga. This house looks too good to be real, but it is. Do you remember seeing it in any holiday classic? It's Ralphie's house from A Christmas Story. You can visit it any time of the year in Cleveland, Ohio, and even stay overnight. There's also a museum across the street with costumes and memorabilia from the movie and rare behind-the-scenes photos. Moving on, does this location ring a bell? If you've seen it once, you'll never forget it. It's a Wonderful Life is one of the holiday classics. It was set in a fictional town in upstate New York and filmed in a movie studio in sunny Los Angeles. But a town called Seneca Falls claims to be the real-life prototype of Bedford Falls. It has a similar location, houses, downtown, and of course, the iconic bridge where it all begins. The director had a family in the area, so they say he stopped here for a haircut while working on the movie. If you're craving some holiday magic, you can visit It's a Wonderful Life Museum in the former movie theater. Let's make things a little bit harder, shall we? Do you recognize this beautiful house? Well, it doesn't scream winter because it's a luxurious mansion in Southern California that became famous after the holiday. The villa where Cameron Diaz's character lives was designed by a famous architect, Wallace Neff, as his own house in the late 1920s. It was built in the Mediterranean style and has a lot of beautiful details. But you don't see them in the movie because the interiors were on a separate soundstage. Several years ago, the mansion was on the market for around $12 million. This village looks like it comes straight from a fairy tale, but it's real, and you will easily remember it if you've seen this holiday classic. Did you get my hint? The holiday classic. 
Yep, it's the village where the second main character of the beautiful love story lives. You won't find Iris' house here because even the exterior was built for the movie. But the village itself is probably the most photographed place in Surrey, England, and it's called Sheer. It has some small shops, a tea house, a museum, an art gallery, two pubs, an old church, and the cutest old footbridge across the stream running through the center of the village. They had to cover the whole place in artificial snow to make it look like an idyllic December. Okay, I know you know what this building is, but what famous scene from which holiday movie was filmed inside its elevator? Yep, I think I gave it away when I said elevator. It's Elf, of course. The ever-awesome story of a human who was raised amongst elves at the North Pole, but eventually found his way to New York. I have to disappoint you though, there aren't really that many buttons inside the cabin, and they don't look like a Christmas tree. This landscape looks nothing like December, but the movie in question features some awkward family lunches and ugly sweaters, so trust me, it belongs here. Are you ready for the big reveal? It's Bridget Jones's diary! Stoke Park is where the bad guy Daniel Cleaver took Bridget for a weekend. The estate has more than 900 years of history, and it also starred in two James Bond movies. Wow, I wish I could teleport to this location right now. But whom would I meet there? Well, this is Bohemian Switzerland in Czechia. And you'd meet Lucy, Edmund, Susan, and Peter there. All the famous characters of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. They filmed the summer scenes in New Zealand, and this place played the role of the Winter Wonderland. Shopping for gifts can be a tiring experience, especially when you do it at the huge Mall of America. Can you remember the characters in which movie chose this place for their last-minute holiday shopping? Jingle All the Way shows us the commercial side of the holiday season. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sinbad are two fathers who have one mission, to get a Turbo Man action figure for their offspring. The largest mall in the Western Hemisphere seems like the best place for that purchase. And while we're on the topic of malls, can something be more about holiday shopping than the giant Macy's flagship in New York? The characters of this movie know it well. I'm sure you had no problem guessing it was a good old classic Miracle on 34th Street. You can still ride the original wooden escalators and meet Santa on the 8th floor. They say Macy's didn't want anything to do with the remake of the movie. So, the C.F. Coles department store from the newer version is the facade of the State of Illinois building in Chicago. Now let's see how well you know the more recent Christmas movies. This beautiful garden appears in one heartbreaking festive season story. Can you name it? The Phoenix Garden is a community garden in Covent Garden, London. And this is where Kate from Last Christmas realizes the scary truth about the guy she's in love with. Wow, that is one festive place. Do you remember it from any movie? It's the Princess Switch, where the Duchess of Montanaro switches places with an ordinary woman from Chicago. Montanaro is not a real place, but its royal palace is. It's Hopeton House near Edinburgh, and it's been home to the Hope family since the late 17th century. It should reopen for visitors in the spring of 2024 after a reconstruction in case you want to stop by. How many locations did you get right? Let me know in the comments below! Movie theaters, red seats, big screens, darkness, and popcorn. The idea of going to the movies and not getting some popcorn now sounds absurd. But why did popcorn become associated with this experience? Actually, the snack is thousands of years old, and it's native to the Americas. The oldest years of popcorn date back to 4,000 years ago, and they were found in New Mexico, USA. We don't know exactly how and for what it was used back then, but it existed that long ago. However, we do know that as early as the 16th century, popcorn was important for the Aztec Indians. They ate it, sure but they also used it for their ceremonies, utilizing it as decoration and headdresses for the statues of their deities. Apparently, there was even a specific popcorn dance that girls would perform. Popcorn's supremacy at its best. 
After that, in the 19th century, popcorn became a very common breakfast food. Yes, people would eat it just like we eat cereal today, with milk or cream. After the use of the moldboard plow became a common practice, it was easy to grow large quantities of popcorn. There was a lot of it, and it was cheap. That's what also made it a perfect thing to use during holidays for food and decoration. The kernels were also a very common gift to give to each other. Today, you probably wouldn't appreciate a pack of popcorn as a gift. But back then, it was so loved that it was the best thing to receive. You could do anything with it. You could cook it, or you could decorate your doorway or fireplace or whatever. Very multi-purpose, and it never goes bad. Like, it really doesn't go bad. How long do you think popcorn seeds last? Apparently, a very long time. Recently, scientists found popcorn kernels from 1,000 years ago in modern-day Chile. And guess what? They still popped after all that time. Popcorn was very popular even throughout the Great Depression. When everything failed, people got poor and businesses went bankrupt. They could still afford a five-cent popcorn bag to brighten up the mood a little bit. When one banker from Oklahoma went bankrupt, he bought a popcorn machine and started selling popcorn on the streets. In a couple of years, he made enough money to buy his three farms back. Despite the tough times, people went to the movies. To attract viewers, ticket prices were reduced to the lowest possible, and quite a few ladies and gentlemen would spend those 10 cents to entertain themselves once in a while. Of course, the experience was very different from the one we have today. Picture this. You put on your best suit and a nice hat and make your way to the movie theater with your wife, who is wearing a beautiful dress and a fancy hat. Yes, it's not sweatpants and a t-shirt. After all, you are going to the theater. The building is a literal movie palace with distinctive architecture and elaborate decorations. You get a drink and popcorn and make your way to your seats, which have ashtrays instead of cup holders. You take off your hat and place it on your lap so that it doesn't obstruct the view for the people behind you. The sign, ladies, please remove your hats, reminds your wife to do the same. Finally, the lights dim, the red velvet curtains open, and you can see the big screen. The movie doesn't start right away. First, it's time for newsreels, movies of events happening around the globe. You can read about those in newspapers or hear about them on the radio. But here, in the movie theater, you've got a rare opportunity to see some footage. After that, a cartoon or two follows, and you enjoy some Mickey Mouse shorts. Only after that does the feature you came to see start. So, what are you watching? It might be Frankenstein, It Happened One Night, Modern Times, Mutiny on the Bounty, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, Charlie Chaplin, Catherine Hepburn, Judy Garland, Henry Fonda. Those are the people who shine on the screen, sometimes black and white, and other times in full color. As you're enjoying the feature, ushers in a uniform quietly sneak into the room with their flashlights, escorting late viewers to their seats. Other times, they look for a particular patron to notify them that they received a call from home and escort them to the box office to take that call. The movie ends, but the night isn't over yet. Back then, people got an over-the-top movie theater experience because there was another feature film afterward, usually an older or less popular one. Many would stay to see that too. But before that, an intermission. You can go and get more treats for the movie while the theater staff uses the time to change reels and start the next feature. In the 1930s, movie theaters were owned by Hollywood Studios and they screened their own movies. This changed in 1948 when a law was passed that allowed any theater to play any feature it ever purchased. That's when the movie theater brands we know today started to appear. Just five years later, the first movie theater with stereophonic sound made its debut, improving the acoustics and starting a new era for movies. In the 90s, reels of film were replaced by digital projectors. More and more movies started to be made digitally 
and every movie theater that wanted to play them had to invest in modern equipment that allowed them to show the new footage. But this equipment was expensive, and not every theater could afford it, leading to some of them going out of business. From then on, movie theaters evolved into what we know today. The picture quality improved, sound reached a whole different level, red curtains were abandoned, the second feature was dropped, and ticket prices increased. Despite all the changes, one thing remains the same. Popcorn. By the way, at first, movie theaters didn't welcome popcorn inside. But here's how it changed. When people started going to the movies, everyone wanted to bring a snack. That could be anything, but the most obvious choice was candy. In the 1940s, the production of sugar and many other unnecessary goods slowed down, resulting in a deficit. So what could people take to the movies instead? That's when they turned to popcorn, a cheap and well-loved snack. At first, movie theater owners were against it and didn't sell it in their theaters. A bunch of people eating popcorn in the dark were bound to leave too much mess. But, well, the demand was there, so outside vendors appeared near movie theaters, selling popcorn to everyone who wanted to sneak it inside. Movie theater owners gave up and decided to rather make money off of that themselves, and the low price of popcorn made it beneficial for them too. Now, almost everyone buys some snacks and drinks, and it was common in the early cinema days too. But did you know that movie theater seats didn't have cup holders until 1981? Yes, AMC was the first theater to install them in the handles, and before that, people just had to hold their drinks the whole time. There must have been way too much mess back then. Still, selling snacks in theaters was the right solution, even if it required quite a bit of cleaning. Did you know that modern movie theaters make most of their money off the snacks they sell inside? Yes, profit from movie tickets mostly goes to the studios theaters buy movies from. A movie theater starts profiting from playing a movie only if it plays it for at least a couple of months, and that's a very long run, which is not for every movie. Meanwhile, profit from snacks mostly goes to the movie theater itself. So, maybe next time don't feel too bitter about overpaying for your popcorn and soda. Those high prices are what keeps many movie theaters in business. They show you commercials for the same reason. This business is tough, and they need to make at least some money to go on. Phantasmagory is said to be the first animated film ever. It was made in 1908 and it's one of the earliest examples of hand-drawn animation. But did you know that ancient people entertained children with cartoons about 2.6 million years ago? A new study reveals that ancient people were the ones who first made pictures look animated. How? They carved pictures of animals on stones and placed them around fires. When the light starts bouncing around, those ancient animals just can't help but shake it and shimmy. The prehistoric carvings come to life in the flickering firelight, with those animals jumping in and out of focus like they're ready to party. Imagine how fun it would have been for prehistoric families to sit around a fire and create these animated carvings. It turns out that even some of the ancient wall paintings and carvings found in caves were inspired by their appearance in the moving light and shadows of flames. So, basically, these old-timey carvings were made to come to life when firelight hit them. And now researchers made a movie showing that cool effect on a 3D model of some horse engravings. The study says our brains are wired to see moving things and changing light, which is why these carvings probably mattered to our ancestors. In other words, cave people were like, Hey, let's carve some cool stuff on this rock, and when we light a fire, it'll look like it's moving. And now these scientists were like, That's awesome! Let's make a movie to show this, everyone! Andy Needham and his teammates used modern scanning and virtual reality tech to study 50 flat carved rocks called plaquettes made of limestone. These rocks were found in southern France back in the 1800s and now sit in a museum in London. They are covered in 77 realistic carvings of all sorts of animals, like horses, reindeer, and chamois. Apparently, Homo sapiens, with a lot of time on their hands, made these engravings a whopping 12,000 to 16,000 years ago. Needham realized that many of these carved rocks were harmed by fire, 
some covered in white ash, others dried or fractured because of heat. Upon closer examination, he discovered pink bands of discoloration resulting from iron deposits in the stone. What's more interesting is that the animal engravings were often superimposed on top of each other, sometimes even melded together, or fitted around each other like some kind of prehistoric animal jigsaw puzzle. Rather than tossing out the old and starting anew, the ancient artists took animal body parts to create new hybrids. For instance, one of the rocks depicts both a horse and a wild cattle-like creature known as a bovid. In this masterpiece of prehistoric art, the horse's abdomen and neck become the back and neck of the bovid, while the horse's head forms the bovid's ear. What a creative way of recycling! Researchers believe that the prehistoric rocks from Montestric were used as primetime entertainment for our ancestors. More than one person carved the animals. People from different levels of skills showed their artistic glory, and it was a group effort. The fact that these rocks were found together also suggests that this was a community activity. So it's like families were all gathered around the TV, carving rocks and cheering on their favorite carved animals. Who needs Netflix when you have Paleolithic TV? The engravings on these rocks and the signs they were exposed to heat suggest they were created to look like they were moving. Sometimes you see different animals in different poses, so one would come to life, and then another, and then a different one. It's like a Stone Age version of Disney. Similar techniques might have influenced some of the ancient cave paintings, such as those at the breathtaking Chauvet Cave in southeastern France. The animal portraits there are also overlaid on each other, and some look like they were heated by fires underneath them, which means that our prehistoric ancestors might have been the first animators in the world. All right, since we talked about young people's favorite pastime activity, shall we take a trip back in time to discover the world's oldest toys? One of the most ancient toys discovered was a simple ball made from clay and found in the ruins of ancient Mesopotamia. It might seem like a simple toy, but our ancestors were playing with them as far back as 3000 BC. But back then, they didn't have fancy video games or elaborate board games, so a ball was the pinnacle of entertainment. But the Mesopotamians weren't the only ones having fun. In ancient Greece, children played with dolls made of clay. In Egypt, kids had toys shaped like animals, but they also had dolls made from materials like clay, papyrus, and ivory. But the most impressive thing about these dolls? They had movable limbs. That's right, our ancient ancestors were playing with articulated dolls before it was cool. But it's not all fun and games. Toys also had a practical purpose back in the day. In fact, Many of the toys discovered by archaeologists were actually used to teach children important skills. For example, Egyptian children played with dolls that were shaped like doctors, which helped them learn about medicine and healthcare. And let's not forget about the toys that were used to train future warriors. In ancient China, kids played with toy horses and chariots, which helped them prepare for a life of battle. Talk about getting a head start on your career! moving on to primitive board games, which have been around for over 5,000 years. The oldest board game is called Sinet, and was discovered in ancient Egyptian tombs. It's a bit like a cross between chess and backgammon, and it was so popular that it was played for over 2,000 years. Now that's a game with staying power. But let's not forget about toys for the little ones. Archaeologists have found ancient rattles and whistles that were used to entertain even younger members of their families. And if you thought your kid's toy collection was impressive, just wait until you hear about the ancient Egyptian princess who had over 100 wooden toys in her chamber. But perhaps the most surprising toy of all was the yo-yo. That's right. The yo-yo has been around for over 2,000 years. It was first invented in ancient Greece and was often used in battle, believe it or not. But eventually people realized that it was much more fun to just play with it and do tricks. Marbles are also around as a toy that has been entertaining kids, and some adults, for thousands of years. Archaeologists have found evidence of marble dating back to around 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley civilization. Back in those days, marbles were made from all sorts of things. Want to take a wild guess? Okay, I'll tell you. Fruit pits and small pieces of smoothed stone. That's right, those ancient kids were getting creative with their playthings. Some artisans even went the extra mile and crafted marbles from clay. Let's head back to ancient Egyptians and their adorable miniature boats made from ivory, wood, and clay. These miniatures may be acknowledged as toys, but they were also meant to represent crossing over to the other side. 
Viking kids had similar types of items too. A wooden toy boat over a thousand years old was found on a farmstead near the coast of Norway. This toy looked like a real boat, and it would have been the ultimate cool thing, just like how kids today go nuts over race cars and drones. You can imagine little ones back then showing off their toy boats to their friends. Many of these toys are still pretty fun to play with today. There are many others left aside, like toy soldiers and spinning tops. Do you want to know more about ancient toys or gadgets from the early days of cinema? Are you ready to find out what social media you would be? Let's start. 1. What makes you the happiest? A. Traveling or shopping. B. Helping others. C. Learning new things. D. Spending time with my family. Option A brings you 30 points. B is worth 20 points. C brings you 10 points. And D is worth 40 points. How long can you survive without your phone? A. 10 seconds. B. Years. I'm not attached to it at all. C. As long as it takes for a new notification to pop up. D. I check it once an hour and feel fine. If you picked A, add 40 points to your score. If you went with B, it's worth 10 points. C brings you 30 points and D, 20 points. 3. Do you have many friends? A. Not really. I'm focused on my success and self-development. B. One or two since high school. We're still very close. C. Plenty of them. We meet up often. D. I used to have many friends, but we don't see each other very often. A brings you 20 points. B is worth 30. C is worth 40 points. D brings you 10 points. 4. You've got your first really good bonus. What do you spend it on? A. That designer bag or watch I've been eyeing for months. B. I'd book a trip somewhere for my family. C. I'd invest it in something to make that money work. D. I'd transfer it to some charity. If option A is your choice, you get 10 points. Did you go with B? It's worth 40 points. C brings you 20 points. D is worth 30 points. 5. Do you follow the news about celebrity life? A. Nope, don't really care and never have. B. Only when the title is super catchy. C. Absolutely. I have to know all the latest gossip. D. There are a couple of celebrities I like and follow online. A. Adds 10 points to your score. B. Is worth 20. And C. Is a 30-point option. D. Brings you 40 points. What is the goal of social media? A. To express yourself, generate cool content, and get followers. B. To get motivation, to learn, and grow. C. To always know what others are up to. D. To speak up on important matters. If you chose A for this one, you get 20 points. B is worth 30 points. If you went with C, add 40 points to your score. And D is worth 10. 7. If you're a movie character, would you be A. A princess waiting to be rescued from the tower. B. A superhero saving the world. C. A villain who scares everyone but becomes good in the end. D. Some cute bunny with huge eyes. A brings you 20 points. B is worth 10. C is a 30-point option. And D gives you 40 points. 8. What do you do first thing in the morning? A. Check my social media, of course. B. Drink a glass of water and do some exercise. C. Send a good morning message to all my group chats. D. Go for a walk. A. Adds 40 points to your score. B. Is worth 10. C. 20 points. And D. 
30 points. 9. How easily do you trust people? A. Quite easily. They haven't let me down. B. It takes me at least a year to really trust someone. C. I don't trust anyone at all. D. If someone close to me says you can trust this person, I believe them. If you went with A, add 40 points to your score. B brings you 20. C is worth 10 points. And D is a 30-point option. 10. Do you answer messages and comments from strangers? A. I have private accounts and only friends can message or comment. B. No, I block them immediately. C. Yes, if it's something meaningful and friendly. D. Of course, I like to get into online fights. A gives you 40 points, B 20 points, C 30 points, and D is worth 10 points. 11. Would you quit your job if your boss had opposing views on something important to you? A. Yes, my opinion is the only right one. B. Only if they make me publicly denounce my views. C. No, I just pretend to agree with them. D. No, I try to adopt their point of view. Option A brings you 10 points, B, 20 points, C, 30 points, and D, 40 points. 12. Now, open the settings on your phone and tell me what takes the most of its memory. A. Photos. I have 2,000 photos of my cat alone. B. Videos. I still need to edit and post them. C. Messenger apps. D. Games. If you choose A, you get 30 points. B gives you 20 points. C is worth 40 points. And D, 10 points. Time to sum up your points. If you scored 120 to 190 points, you're Twitter. You have an opinion on everything, and you aren't afraid to share it with others. When someone doesn't agree with you, you're happy to explain why you're in the right. You won't back down, even if it's someone with more authority. You like to learn the news first and believe no information is useless. You're witty and your jokes are smart and sophisticated. Those who ended up with 200 to 250 points, it looks like you're a walking Pinterest. You have great taste and like to make the world around you a prettier place, from your phone wallpaper to your backyard. You always have some cool ideas on where to go and what to give someone for their birthday. You like to sort things out into groups, order is really important to you. Did you get 260 to 310 points? Congrats! Your inner social network is Facebook. You have a broad spectrum of interests and you like to learn from different sources. You put a lot of your time and soul into staying close to other people. You always find a kind word for everyone and genuinely care about their issues. People often ask you for advice or just share with you because they know you're a great listener and have a lot of life experience. If you have 320 to 370 points, looks like you'd be Instagram if you were born a social network. You never say no to an opportunity to go somewhere new or some new people and take a selfie with them, of course. You're a visual learner and you feel happier when you see something beautiful or cute. You always like to know what's going on in the lives of others and never get bored of seeing their breakfast choices. Those who got 380 to 430 points, put your hands up and jump forward. Now freeze. Yes, we're filming a TikTok dance here because that's your inner social network. You're full of energy, love a fast-paced life, and don't hold on to the past too much. You're brave enough to experiment with new approaches and formats. You're a fast learner, and if someone can't get to the point instantly, you get easily bored. In case you came to the finish line with 440 to 490 points, LinkedIn is the social network for your personality. You're goal-oriented and know exactly what you want. You see other people as prospective, useful connections for your career. You like networking, but never share anything personal. It's rather hard for you to let people close, and you can only show your true self to your old friends. You like to analyze things and make plans. 
If you have somewhere between 500 and 550 points, you like watching videos so much, YouTube is basically your second self. Your interests are diverse, and you are equally excited to find out how to build a log cabin and why there are little triangles above some windows on the plane. You find comfort in the voices of your favorite vloggers and like following instructions. You're a great team player, and the community means a lot to you. Those who got over 550 points. What was that sound? Looks like you got a new message on WhatsApp. It is your kind of social media since you're super communicative and like to share literally everything with your family and friends. You feel uncomfortable when you don't have access to your phone for some reason. You worry a lot about your dearest ones and need to hear their opinion before making any decisions in life. Hey screamers and full-time trick-or-treaters, I have the ultimate horror movie challenge for you. I'll give you some random information about the plots of the movies and shows, and you will have to guess their names. Now grab your quill and grimoire to write down your scores. Give yourself a candy point if you know the answer, and a slap on the face, I mean no point, if you don't. Let's begin. In this movie, the main characters and their kids are accompanied by four singing busts while searching for the mausoleum. Can you tell me which movie this is? And here's a hint, it has the word haunted in it. <laughs> it's Disney's The Haunted Mansion, which was released in 2003. You can also find the ride attraction of this movie at Disneyland. And actually, the movie is based on the ride and not the other way around. In this movie, the neighbor of the main character scares children away from his front yard and confiscates their belongings. Do you know its name? It's the 2006 animated movie, Monster House. One of its screenwriters received a letter about how this movie is nightmare inducing. Well, you'll have to watch and decide for yourself if you haven't yet. In this movie, the main character travels into a world where all the creatures have buttons instead of eyes. Which movie is this character from? It's the 2009 stop-motion movie Coraline, which was based on the Neil Gaiman book of the same name. If you haven't watched it yet, here's some advice. Don't be tricked by it being an animation. Think twice before watching it with any kids around, because I guarantee that it'll give you the heebie-jeebies. In this movie, a zombie falls in love with a living human girl and does everything he can to protect her. Do you know it? It's Warm Bodies, which was released in 2013 and based on a novel. By the way, it's also a romantic comedy movie, so you can watch it on Valentine's Day too. It's a win-win for partners with different film tastes, am I right? In this movie, David Bowie steals a baby. Do you know the name of it? This movie is called Labyrinth and it was released in 1986. Since it's an old one, don't beat yourself up if you don't know it. But David Bowie sings with puppets in it so it's a good fit for the pumpkin season. This one is not a movie. It's a mini-series, and in it, one of the characters wears a teapot on his head and has a pet frog. Do you know its name? It's Over the Garden Wall. This 10-episode animated show aired in 2014, but it quickly became a classic. This movie's antagonist is a bio-exorcist, and his name consists of two words, a bug and a drink. Can you guess the movie? It's Tim Burton's 1988 movie, Beetlejuice. Here's some great news for its fans. Earlier this year, it was announced that there's going to be a sequel to it. This movie is about a vampire who returns to his ancestral home after being imprisoned for almost 200 years, only to find out his dysfunctional descendants need his help. Do you know its name?
Another movie by the gothic director Tim Burton. This one is called Dark Shadows, and it was actually based on a television soap opera of the same name. In this movie, a boy has to lift a 300-year-old witch's curse to save his town, despite the fact that everyone in it thinks he's crazy. Can you tell me what this movie is? It's the 2012 animated stop-motion movie, Paranorman, which is actually produced by the same company that made Coraline. In this movie, a boy is turned into a mouse by the leader of a witch coven. Do you know its name? This movie, which is based on a Roald Dahl novel, is called The Witches, and it actually has two versions. The first one was made in 1990, and the second one was made in 2020. Since I'm feeling generous, you can give yourself an extra point if you knew this information. In this movie, a boy must tell scary stories to a witch every night in order to survive. Can you guess its name? It's the 2021 movie called Night Books. In this movie, monsters, which are actually characters from books, come to life. And the author of the books must stop them with the help of a few teenagers before they wreak havoc upon their town. Can you tell me its name? It's the 2015 movie Goosebumps, which is based on the horror book series of the same name, written by Robert Lawrence Stein. So you've made it to question number 13. It's time to take things up a notch on the scary meter then. In this movie, a group of counselors try to reopen an abandoned summer camp with a grim past. Tell me its name. Come on, I know you know this. It's nothing other than the 1980 movie, Friday the 13th, of course. You know what the funny thing is? The Friday the 13th franchise actually consists of 12 movies as of today. This movie follows a young pregnant woman with peculiar neighbors, whom she thinks have sinister intentions for her baby. Do you know the name of it? Psychological horror, everyone? It's the 1968 movie, Rosemary's Baby. The movie which its producers thought to be cursed due to some tragic events that took place while filming it. In this movie, after hearing some unfortunate news, a woman and her family begin to discover terrifying secrets about their ancestry. Vague much? But you can tell me its name if you're a true horror fan. It's the 2018 movie, Hereditary. By the way, did you know that its director pitched this movie as a family drama? Talk about marketing skills, am I right? Do you think your life is more like work hard, play hard? Or like all work and no play? If your answer is the latter, then which movie's antagonist feel the same way as you? The movie that uses the all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy proverb is Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which was based on the Stephen King novel of the same name. If you were a character in this movie, you would have to live in complete silence to be able to survive. Can you name the movie? It's the 2018 post-apocalyptic movie, A Quiet Place, with a sequel released in 2021. Shh. In this movie, a group of losers have to destroy a shape-shifting sewer monster. What movie is it? It's the 2017 movie, It. Just like The Shining, this one is also a Stephen King novel adaptation. Here's another miniseries question for you. This one is about five siblings who eventually have to flee the house they were trying to renovate. Do you know which series this is? This 10-episode miniseries is The Haunting of Hill House, and it's actually the first installment of The Haunting Anthology series. How about we end things on a higher note, so that you'll still be able to sleep in the dark? 
In this last movie, there's a giant plant that sings to be fed. Do you know it? It's Little Shop of Horrors, which was adapted by an off-Broadway musical, which itself was adapted by the 1960 movie of the same name. Now, let's see how well you did. If you have 0 to 5 candy points, you're a ghost because nobody can see you anywhere near the movie theater. If you have 6 to 10 candy points, you're a zombie because you're slow when it comes to catching up with movies. If you have 11 to 15 candy points, you're a werewolf who once in a while misses a movie due to nights with the full moon. If you have 16 to 21 candy points with an extra point included, you're a vampire who drinks every movie in. Huh? Huh? Hey, what's that noise? How long have you been sleeping? You try to move your neck. It's a little bit stiff. You've had a good nap, but fell asleep in an uncomfortable position. In the movie theater. Oh, now you remember. The movie was really boring. You were tired after a long day at work, so you couldn't help it. You look around. Everyone's out. You're alone. Everything is clean, with no popcorn or soda cans on the floor. Weird. The credits are rolling down the screen, so it's time to go. It might be pretty late, and you don't want to miss your bus. You get up, stretch, and slowly go to the door. You enter the hallway. No one is there. You're confused. Usually when you stay at the movie theater so late, someone walks you out and reminds you they're closing. And there's always a mess left by people who have been walking around all day, eating snacks and dropping popcorn to the floor. But now, everything is clean and peaceful as if the movie theater isn't open at all. You check the bathrooms. No one's there. The lights are dimmed, but you can see where you're going. And still, ugh, everything looks kind of creepy with no one around. Hello? You try calling for people a couple of times. No answer. You follow the exit sign and get to the closed door. Temporarily closed because of renovation. Huh? How long is that temporarily? You start panicking, and then suddenly get angry. How could the staff forget to wake you up? You start yelling, trying to open the door, but nothing works. You check your phone. Of course, it's off. You forgot to charge it. Then you suddenly hear some noise coming from one of the halls. You start shivering. Is it possible that someone else is trapped here too? You slowly move toward the hall and cautiously open the door. But it's just the beginning of another movie. This hall is empty too. Trying to distract yourself, you get popcorn, candies, soda, and even some ice. Finally, you're on time to get the best seat. Oh boy, that was epic! You were still sitting and laughing at some of those jokes you heard, when suddenly, a new movie starts. Great, why not see that one too? Workers will probably get here in the morning anyway. Your friends are going to be so jealous when they find out you've spent a night in the movie theater for free. Two more movies later, and you realize you have no idea what time it is, but you feel very tired. Tomorrow's a new day, it'll get better. Grr, still no news, nobody's come. The noise coming from your stomach is getting louder, so you go and grab some new snacks. Time for some more movies the marathon that you've always wanted to take part in. You hit the first hall. A comedy is on. You realize each hall shows its own movie genre. And when a movie finishes, a new one immediately starts. At one point, the screen always goes white. It's your cue that it's time to go to sleep. Days pass by with you waiting for workers every morning and watching new movies every day. There's some old movies too in different languages and from different countries. Your daily routine is always the same. You get up and have breakfast. You found a large stock of sandwiches in the fridge. After watching several movies, you walk around and explore the place. Then lunch, some more movies, dinner, and it's already bedtime. You feel completely hypnotized by all the movies you watch. Some make you laugh so hard you can't fall asleep afterwards because you keep thinking about their plots. Others bring tears to your eyes. Some make you think. And there are movies that scare you so much that instead of falling asleep, you get up every five minutes to check every suspicious noise you hear. 
Your life doesn't change. No one comes. Every day is the same. At first, you still try to count how many days you're trapped at the movie theater. But after a while, you lose track of time. Your eyes have become red from staring at the screen for hours on end. You sometimes feel terrified when looking at yourself in the bathroom mirror. Your skin has gone pale. You've gained some extra weight. And your shoulders have become rounded from sitting and sleeping in an uncomfortable position. From time to time, you try to work out and add some healthy habits to your life. But most of the time, you feel as if you're the main character of some weird movie. The one where you can't figure out what's real and what's not. You keep seeing things out of the corner of your eye, but when you turn around, there's nothing. You decide not to watch scary movies anymore. And then, you accidentally find yourself in a seat, waiting for the next movie to start. And before you know it, the movie has you hooked. And you can't stop watching even though you know you won't be able to sleep at night. You start feeling increasingly lonely. Movie characters become your only friends. You constantly talk to them in your head, or even out loud. The silence after you stop is horrible. And the dark corners of the movie theater seem even scarier at such moments. Your stomach hurts. You're sick and tired of snacks, candies, sandwiches, and popcorn. Unbelievable, but the only thing you're craving is a bowl of warm soup. You don't enjoy movies anymore. Nothing seems funny, sad, or even scary. You often watch a movie not knowing what it's about. It feels as if you're stuck on a deserted island, but kind of worse. There, you'd at least have beaches, sunsets, palm trees, and maybe even a chance to escape after a while. You miss fresh air, sunlight, the feeling of rain on your skin. You close the doors of the movie theater halls and stand next to the ticket office. You're done with opening credits, movie music, your favorite actors. You don't want anything to do with movies. You start exploring the place, paying even more attention to details than you did before. You enter all the halls one by one and try to find new exit options. You start to lose hope, but then you remember something from the movie you saw a couple of days before and run to the bathroom. Here's the vent. It's now or never. It's pretty high. Two garbage cans. Great. Maybe you'll reach it now. Your construction keeps swinging but you somehow manage to crawl into the hole before the garbage can tower crashes down. You have to get through an entire maze up there before you, finally, get out. Ah, a warm, nice night. It feels as if this is the first time you've taken a deep breath in over a year. The movie theater isn't in the city center, so you start walking home. When you arrive, your roommate can barely believe his eyes. Have you got back from Aruba? He sounds surprised. You have no idea what he's talking about. He says, You were disappointed with your job and didn't know what to do. So you told everyone you needed something different. Maybe a couple of months on Aruba or something like that. So we all thought you wanted to disappear for a while and then get in touch with people again. Your phone was off for a year and you didn't reply on social media. No, it wasn't Aruba the movie theater, all kinds of movies from all over the world, lots of popcorn, the renovation, no one ever came. You try to tell your roommate the story. You're hurrying, missing words, skipping parts of the story, but he's just looking at you, confused. You decide to just show him the place, but when you get there, he doesn't want to come closer. That place has been closed for years. I can't remember ever seeing it open. There's a story about a guy who owned it. He was a great movie fan and wanted to collect movies from all over the world. He was going to renovate this movie theater, but then he suddenly disappeared. No one knew what had happened. The theater was closed down and has been under renovation since then. People have heard noises coming from that building, but no one wanted to come any closer to investigate. Oh, how did you end up in such a place? You suddenly notice someone move near the theater. They start walking towards you. You try to run away, but you can't move. What's going on? You jolt awake in your seat. Was it all just a dream? Credits on the screen mean the movie you've been watching is over. The hall is empty, and you quickly leave it. No one is there. 
Oh no, not again! Hello? You yell in panic. Silence. And then... Yes? A huge train is rushing down the tracks. Brakes screeching! In a few seconds, a thousand-ton steel battering ram will crash into a bus that is stuck on the railroad crossing. Only a miracle can save the people. Wait, what's that? Moments before the collision, a human figure appears. The person's flying off the nearby mountain with a jetpack behind their back. Their body is protected by an exoskeleton. The suit is similar to the armor of a knight and makes a person incredibly strong. They land in front of the train and press their hands on its front. The exoskeleton absorbs the impact. Wheels screech like crazy. Then, a loud whistling squeal. And, just a few feet away from the bus, the train finally stops. The bus doors aren't working. People can't get out of it. The hero produces a lightsaber from their belt and cuts a new door. This scenario might seem too fantastic, but a lot of cool things previously seen only in comics and movies are now reality. Sarkos Robotics Exoskeleton makes the operator 20 times stronger, reduces the likelihood of injury, and doesn't restrain movement. This model is just one of many examples. In the near future, these mechanisms will appear on the streets and will become as familiar as flying drones or hoverboards. In such a suit, you can both rescue people and lift a fridge upstairs alone. But the armor seems incomplete if it can't fly. Richard Browning is the founder of Gravity Industries, a company developing jetpacks. He's also the chief test pilot. His apparatus consists of a large jet engine behind the back and two smaller ones on either arm. The person dressed in it looks like a character in a sci-fi action movie. If you weigh less than 200 pounds, this backpack will let you fly. The catch? Right now, it costs $440,000 to make one. The lightsaber is what fun science means. Several generations of scientists, bloggers, and Jedi fans are trying to create their trademark. The main contender for a lightsaber is high-energy plasma. The strength of the magnetic field will help the plasma keep its shape in the air. But there's a problem. To make the saber work, you'll need to carry a lot of equipment with you. And let's not forget about the ultraviolet radiation and heat that comes from hot plasma. The Burner Metal Vapor Torch is currently the best alternative to the Jedi Sword. This device cuts through a metal door in a few seconds, but fencing with a torch won't work. The cloak that makes a person invisible is no longer a fantasy. Canadian company Hyper Stealth Biotechnology Corp has developed a fabric that will make you disappear. There's no magic in the work of the cloak, just good old physics. This cloak of invisibility creates an optical illusion that hides you from prying eyes. Since 1985, the hoverboard got lots of attention from people all over the world, and inventors have been trying to recreate this design for decades. Many companies have developed their own flying skateboard designs, There's a hoverboard powered by a stream of water, burning kerosene, electricity, or rotating propellers. Arcs Pax Hendo is the closest to its sci-fi prototype. The model can fly in all directions, turn and break. This is possible due to two magnetic fields that repel each other. In 1947, US engineers looked at the car and decided it was boring. Or maybe we can make it fly. Great idea, that. The result of their work was the Model 118 Conv Air Car. Roughly speaking, they took a passenger car and attached a plane with a propeller to its roof. Companies around the world continue to invest millions of dollars in the flying car project, although their cars today look more like drones or helicopters. Many researchers are confident we'll never build a flying car. It's too expensive and dangerous. Who knows? In the 19th century, people said these four-wheeled carts would never replace a horse. But today, a comfortable ride on the highway always beats riding a horse in the prairie. While engineers are trying to get cars to fly, their colleagues have made it so that transport doesn't need a driver anymore. The computer takes over the controls. If you need to go to a supermarket or restaurant, 
your self-driving car will choose the best route itself. It also knows how to park. I should have started with this. The car distinguishes between other road users thanks to sensors, video cameras, and powerful computer processors. It notices traffic signals and road signs. The robo-taxi project is one of the most promising ones in the field. Most likely, in the next 10 to 20 years, driving schools will become a thing of the past. For thousands of years, ancient people sat by fires and looked at the starry sky. Our civilization has already explored space firsthand, but there are still more questions than answers. There have been 600 astronauts in space in 60 years. Of these, seven people are tourists who have visited the International Space Station. For the right to see our planet from a height of 250 miles, you have to pay $50 million. SpaceX and its owner Elon Musk are willing to establish a colony on Mars by 2050. One million people will settle in the first ever Martian city. You don't have to get on board a spaceship to feel like you're on another planet. 80% of the world's oceans are unexplored and unmapped. Marine vessel manufacturers offer to explore the seabed in comfort. To this end, they've developed submarine yacht designs that combine comfort and safety. The private submarine Migaloo M5 is as long as the Washington Monument is tall, and it can stay underwater for four weeks. The set includes a hangar with a helicopter, jet skis, and mini bath escapes. There are no buyers yet, but it's only a matter of time. Imagine that you're a scuba diver who descended to the bottom of the ocean. There's darkness all around you, but the flashlight can handle it. You breathe liquid that fills your helmet up to your eyes. Wait, what? We can't breathe water or, for example, soda, because these substances don't have enough oxygen, not because they're liquid. In the future, scuba divers will breathe liquid enriched with oxygen. It'll also allow for deep diving. American company Second Sight Medical Products has developed an artificial eye that can restore vision to a blind person. It's called Argus 2. It's actually an electronic retinal implant and the first step in creating the bionic eye. Perhaps in the future, it'll be able to zoom in and out of objects, make the image clear, or turn on infrared light. Augmented reality glasses haven't reached technical perfection yet, most futurists are confident they'll change our world, just like the internet did. Why do you need a TV or computer? At your command, the glasses will lower a virtual screen of any size in front of you with your favorite TV series. The same applies to furniture, clothing, and dishes. All this will be replaced by virtual stuff. Augmented reality glasses digitize any item that surrounds you and makes it look how you want it to. Unless you take them off, of course. Today, you have a Mediterranean landscape out your window, and tomorrow, you've got a view of Times Square. Hard drives and computer optical drives store enormous amounts of data, but this technology is unreliable. Over time, disks become unreadable. Scientists have almost solved this problem. They learned how to write electronic data into the DNA of living bacteria. Biological processes take place inside every living cell, Scientists have managed to program them using computer systems methods. Nanobots will appear in the next 10 years. In movies and comics, villains are most often associated with this technology. In the real world, nanobots will be used in medicine. Each robot is no larger than a molecule. By launching a flock of nanobots into the human body, doctors will be able to monitor the health and physical condition of their patients. And probably the best thing about nanobots is that they can be 3D printed. Cloning a dinosaur might not seem like a good idea in movies, but real scientists say it's not even an option. Genes can be used for cloning if they're no more than 1 million years old, and dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. But there are other animals as well. There's a high probability that mammoths will reappear on Earth in the next 50 years, as well as woolly rhinoceroses and even saber-toothed tigers. Scientists plan to implant genetic material of extinct animals into the DNA of existing ones, elephants, rhinos, and tigers. 
In sci-fi movies, we often see spaceships and stations shooting colorful beams into space that attract other ships. Australian scientists have managed to create such a beam, only it's invisible. Their beam is capable of capturing and holding atoms floating in a vacuum. Of course, these aren't huge space stations yet, but this is a big step in the study of physics. Scientists have created a quantum funnel that will allow studying the individual atoms and molecules that make up everything around. Think you can guess all the movies by emojis? All right, here we go. Hmm, an easy start. It's Spider-Man. Or maybe Little Miss Muffet. The Karate Kid. Plain and simple. Hey, wax on, wax off. Look out, it's Jaws. I'll bet you're singing the theme song in your head right now. Who you gonna call? Ghostbusters. Jurassic Park. One of my favorites. It's the boy who lived, Harry Potter. The Wizard of Oz. Of course, it's Thor. Man, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, I'd be Thor too. The Boss Baby. Bingo! Hey, any way you slice it, it's Edward Scissorhands. That's all you need to guess. Titanic. Love that one. That's Men in Black. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Classic. Now, it's okay if you guessed Willy Wonka and the You Know What. For me, that's the better movie. That's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Did you recognize Forrest Gump? That one's Marley and Me. Monsters, Inc. That's right. Brave. Such a good movie. The most famous scene in E.T. Another great movie. It's Moana. You're welcome. It's The Devil Wears Prada. Did you see Joker? Ooh. The silent.
silence of the lambs. What's for dinner? <laughs> Madagascar, right O. Hey, it's Coco. What else can it be? It's Ratatouille. Anyone can cook. Ah, they're getting tougher. That's Mary Poppins. Hey, let's go fly a kite. Now this one stumped me. It's Moneyball. I hope you got this one. It's fantastic beasts and where to find them. Great Scott! It's back to the future! Surely you recognize Twilight. Million Dollar Baby Ah, straight to the point! It's Planet of the Apes! That's emoji speak for Home Alone. And this one's Finding Nemo. Think literal for this one. It's a beautiful mind. I know, the flag instantly gave it away. Yep, it's Pirates of the Caribbean. Mmm, dumplings. Kung Fu Panda is right. Now, who hasn't seen the notebook besides me? Think simple here King Kong. The sound of music. There it is. The Chronicles of Narnia. Now think musicals. It's Mamma Mia. I've got that one right. Now, no need to overthink, it's The Jungle Book. Ah, that's clever. It's Transformers. Ooh, Night at the Museum. Huh, now it makes sense. The curious case of Benjamin Button, of course. Pretty tough. It's the Truman Show. Shrek, you got it. And this one's The Hunger Games.
everyone's favorite epic saga, Star Wars. Did you recognize the Revenant? Not after the bear got him. Oops, spoiler. This is getting more challenging, movie buffs. It's a quiet place. Highly recommended. That's La La Land. Decoded. That's Legally Blonde. Tricky. That's Knives Out. This is I Am Legend. Oh, the terminal. Oh, I see. It's interstellar. Bonus points if you got this toughie. That's eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Now, at some earlier stages of research, scientists reconstructed the megalodon looking like a bigger, just a little more dangerous, version of a great white shark. Movies then followed suit, added a couple of details on their own, and ta-da! We've got a marine giant that could grow up to 90 feet long. Well, hold on, hold on. Megalodons were usually between 50 and 55 feet, sometimes growing up to 60 feet. For comparison, a bowling lane is 60 feet long, a school bus is around 45 feet, and an average person is 5 feet 10 inches tall. So yeah, not bad megalodon, but still not 90 feet. Its weight was around 50 to 60 tons, which is something like 10 adult elephants or even a Boeing 737. That's just their females, though. The ladies were almost twice as big as the males. Another movie versus reality thing. The megalodon had nothing to do with a great white shark. The closest they could be is cousins, because megalodon, in fact, is the last descendant of a completely different lineage of sharks. Plus, its kind is around three times bigger than an average great white. It has a shorter nose and a much flatter jaw that almost looks like it's squashed. Also, Meg's pectoral fins are longer than those of the great white sharks. Ancient predators ate a lot, so they needed something to support their weight. They both had an excellent sense of smell, though, so even in prehistoric times, it wasn't a good idea to go swimming with a chunk of raw meat in hand. And it certainly isn't safe now. Whether the Meg's hiding somewhere in the depths, which some still believe is true, or it's gone forever, younger cousins will be there waiting. Also, both of them like to go after big marine mammals, so they would certainly have things to do together. That is, until the Meg got moody and accidentally ate its friend. Eh, you never know. These guys had a different hunting style. Great whites prefer to dive straight toward their prey and find the softest spots, like exposed legs or underbelly. Megalodon aimed for the fins and tail because of its almost 10-foot jaws and what's considered to be the strongest bite ever, its teeth could pierce almost anything. Sometimes an entire tooth would be found embedded in the bone of some bigger animal, such as a whale. Without the main parts they used for swimming, poor sea animals were then helpless and unable to escape. Yet whales were just a smaller part of the megalodon's diet. Seals, sea cows, squids, dolphins, other sharks, the good old Meg probably wouldn't say no to some random school of smaller fish swimming into its mouth either. Nothing better than a good snack after a big, tasty dinner. Even those giant turtles weren't safe within their thick shells. The Meg probably took those as a dare challenge on a daily basis. Such a diverse diet, and in big amounts. Megalodon would eat about 2,500 pounds of food every day. No wonder it dominated the ocean. Almost 300 teeth in 5 rows. 
and we're talking about sharp choppers that could grow up to 7 inches long. Even its name stands for giant tooth. Hey, I'm thinking maybe it had a cousin, orthodontia, which means either crooked teeth or deep pockets. Still, Megalodon would change thousands of teeth over a lifetime. Since Meg's teeth weren't that strong, they would often fall out. Then it would get new ones within one to two days, so it could continue its hunting sessions without any serious interruptions. The same thing happens with modern sharks as well. New teeth replace damaged or worn out ones. Those teeth falling out were the only thing that helped scientists do any research on the Megalodon at all. They found them all around the world. Yep, Megalodons were quite some travelers. They lived in all oceans, and their fossils were found on all continents except Antarctica. What? Too cold? Since their skeletons were not made of bone but of cartilage, teeth are the only evidence they've ever even existed. They gave scientists an insight into a lot of things, including size. Even with modern sharks, scientists determine their size by the dimensions of only one tooth, and do the same with the meg. Megalodon had the strongest bite of all living creatures on Earth. It would definitely be fun to see the clash between the meg and, say, T-Rex. Sadly, they missed their chance to meet and establish some long-term friendship since dinosaurs went extinct over 60 million years ago. Meg, on the other hand, terrified all the inhabitants of the seas and oceans from 23 to 2.5 million years ago. Where could Megalodon live these days? Well, it would probably love the places modern sharks go to, such as Florida, Hawaii, Brazil, South Africa, or some other tropical paradise. Hmm, when you think about it, it's not bad at all. Meg, <laughs> take me with you! Meg itself didn't have any serious competition or a natural enemy, but its infants were too weak to defend themselves. That's why the apex predator had to choose warm, shallow waters with no strong currents to raise its babies. Those, by the way, were around 6.5 feet long, not quite tiny themselves. Scientists actually found some of their juvenile's teeth, so it seems like part of their nursery areas was the coast of Panama. And that's 10 million years old. Okay, time to meet with one of Megalodon's potential rivals, the mighty sperm whale. 45 to 60 feet long, the size sure makes it quite an adversary. Modern sperm whales don't have such big teeth, but their ancestors, which lived around 13 million years ago, were well packed. The largest tooth found was 5 inches wide and 14 inches long. That's something like the biggest soda bottle out there. That would make an interesting combat. Here, we're talking about this giant marine predator. But this is not the only intriguing ancient animal that wandered the oceans. In fact, sharks are some of the oldest creatures on our planet, more ancient than insects, mammals, dinosaurs, even trees. Mass extinction events wiped out most life on Earth. Giant asteroids fell on its surface, continents split up, and so many other things happened. But sharks were there, alive, persevering, apparently with no contact with the outside world, just chilling and doing their thing. The spiny shark was actually one of the first animals with a jaw. Not that it could do much with that jaw, since it was only around 12 inches long. Eh, Meg wouldn't even bother around this one, and it wasn't even a real shark, it just looked like one. If you ever wondered how a combination of eel and shark would look like, well, here it is. Eel shark preferred fresh water, was up to 3 feet long, and went extinct around 200 million years ago. Since dinosaurs appeared around 230 million years ago, the eel shark was probably there to give them warm welcome, prepare a buffet, but the dinosaurs had unfortunately mistaken it for dessert. Now, this predator would get some real screams on a nice sandy beach during a spring break if it was still alive – the Ginsu shark. It was nicknamed after Ginsu knives for a huge mouth of almost 500 razor-sharp teeth. One of this monster shark's hobbies was to go after big turtles. Okay, now seriously, what's with that shark turtle thing? Scissor-toothed sharks. Now we're talking. These guys lived around 300 million years ago and had some strangely shaped heads. 
The weirdest part were their jaws. This shark didn't shed old and worn-out teeth, but kept growing new ones at the back. Those in the front were then pushed forward, and with age, the shark got a really strange scissor-tooth look. Scientists are still unsure why it had to be like that. Hey, time to call in the orthodon! Even during the Meg's long reign, our favorite ancient predator still wasn't the only scary giant shark in town. For instance, um, well, I can't pronounce its name, so I'll just call it Mr. C. Unfortunately, not enough of its fossils were found to get more information. But some research says it had teeth more than 5 inches long. That also implies it could probably grow to be 20 feet long. Oh, and if it only left just a couple more teeth around, I guess the Meg wouldn't be the only movie star from those times. So close, C. So close. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay